We wouldn't have or adopt children if we weren't anxious to be their greatest friends. It's the quality of the time together that counts, not the number of waking hours. I think I was a good mother. All of my four children were adopted at the age of 10 days after I'd had a heartbreaking series of miscarriages. They understood that they were especially chosen, and I think that they were rather pleased about that. Of course, every woman tries to be a good mother and then wonders if, after all of her best efforts, her children will wind up complaining about bad treatment. And she wasn't that kind of person that my sister Christina had said. She was very caring and loving. So I want you to know that my sister Cindy's and my feelings are in complete contrast to those of Christina's. Twins Kathy and Cynthia, nicknamed Sydney Crawford, were two of classic Hollywood actress Joan Crawford's adopted children. They were born on January 13, 1947, to 21 year old Theta Mildred Cotton. Kathy was the firstborn, eight minutes older than Cindy. They were born prematurely and required hospital supervision for several weeks. Their biological mother died seven days after their birth due to kidney failure. Their biological father, J.W. Jordan, had abandoned their biological mother during the pregnancy and birth. On January 20th, 1947, the twins' biological mother signed custody over to the infamous Tennessee Children's Home so they could be cared for and adopted. These are the only two children of Joan Crawford's to be associated with the Tennessee Children's Home. It is believed, through the concluding chapter of Crawford's research, that these two children were obtained by Alice Howe, the Los Angeles baby broker, whom Joan had worked with previously to acquire all of her other children, including Christina. There is no evidence to support that Crawford knew or worked directly with Georgia Tan. Kathy and Sydney lived with Joan at her Brentwood home for over a year before she officially adopted them on June 11, 1948. When Crawford married Alfred Steele in 1955, he took on the role of the twins' adoptive father until his death in 1959. He was even listed as Kathy's father on her obituary. I was strict about some things. The pediatrician told me that if all children took naps until they were 12, they'd be the healthiest ever. The children hated that as they grew older, but it certainly paid off in good health. They were taught the kind of self-sufficiency I'd had to learn in quite a different way when I was working my way through school. When they were old enough to stand on a stool in the sink, they washed out their shoelaces and polished their little white shoes every day before putting them away. They hung up their clothes if they were clean, which wasn't very often. But I didn't stand over them with a whip. If that kind of training is starting early enough, it becomes second nature and it leaves you time to get on with more important things. I was strict when I thought it was necessary, but I balanced it with tenderness, love, and plenty of my time. She was a disciplinarian. She, uh, she wanted us to grow up um, independently, um, self-reliant, and to set our goals to what we believe is, was right. But we still had to make our beds and wash our dishes. In 2008, Kathy reminisced about her childhood with Vanity Fair. She mentioned two of Joan's close friends, actors Uncle Van Johnson and Uncle Butch, Cesar Romero, whom often visited their home, played with them, and talked with them. Despite calling them uncles, Kathy and her sisters knew they were not their actual uncles but felt like family. My children met all my friends, and on informal occasions, they'd join us at the dinner table in their high chairs. They were famous actors and great directors, but to the children, they were just family friends. One day, the twins were looking at television. After a few minutes, they ran upstairs to where I was working and said indignantly, Why didn't you tell us Uncle Butch is Caesar Romero? But even when they realized that some of the family friends were world famous, they formed their own candid opinions of them. They judged people in terms of whether they were kind and related to them. 
They hated those who treated them like little people, or worse yet, as Joan Crawford's children. Kathy recalled a particular joyful memory she shared with her mother, going to see the musical Hello, Dolly! with Sidney, her twin sister. Carol Channing, a friend of Joan's, was part of the production. They had excellent seats in the theater and the privilege of going backstage afterwards. Carol Channing gave each of them beautiful bracelets with what they thought were small diamonds. Later on, they discovered the stones were actually rhinestones, but cherished them the same. Joan Crawford also made the twins do household chores as they grew up, including washing dishes, making beds, and keeping their rooms tidy. Additionally, they were asked to help with gardening by pulling weeds. Kathy said in this interview she remembered this time as great fun, although acknowledging her mother's strictness, but noting it was not to the extreme her sister Christina mentions. Now we're settled in the living room of Miss Joan Crawford's tastefully decorated home. A colorful Christmas tree at one edge of the room is almost snowed under with packages. Across the white carpet on the other wall, a stately colonial fireplace is prepared for the flames that will be warming the room before long, and the mantle is waiting for the Christmas stockings. Miss Crawford and her children are seated on one Davenport facing me. Miss Crawford, my listeners and I are so pleased that you've invited us in to share a few moments of this Christmas Eve with you. We're very happy to have you with us, George. Suppose you start, Miss Crawford, by introducing your children to our radio audience. This is my eldest daughter, Christina. Hello, everyone. And my son, Christopher. Hi, everybody. And my twins, Cynthia and Kathy, who will content themselves with smiling for your <laughs> listeners since they're not quite three. Hello, Cynthia and Kathy, and how old are you, Christina? The children were brought to me on the set when they were infants and all my spare moments were spent with them. They came to meet me in the evening and we drove home together and I had dinner with them. Our Sundays were precious. I took them to Sunday school and then there was a picnic or an outing in the afternoon. Between every picture we would hit the road in the station wagon, the five of us, and a medium-sized poodle. The twins rode in little homemade cribs that were tied on so that when I drove, they would rock as if they were in cradles. We often drove to Carmel on weekends, and we loved walking along the shore. Christopher taught the little ones how to pick up the seashells and how when the waves came in and washed out again, they'd find the tiny shells. I showed them how to pick out the most perfect ones and to hold them very gently so as not to crush them. We carried little baskets, and there was a competition to see who could collect the most. When I took the children to see the redwoods for the first time, they stood in reverence. They couldn't even see the tops of the trees, and they were awed when we drove right through them. They were thrilled at the salmon run in Oregon. They had a taste of ranching at a place beyond Santa Barbara called Alisal Ranch. The head wrangler, Bill, used to lead both the twins' horses. Kathy loved horses, but the poor child was so allergic to them and would come back with her eyes streaming. I finally found an allergy pill that helped her until she outgrew it. We read a great deal of poetry together. I read aloud until they were able to, and then the older ones would read to the younger children. They loved the comic verses and cried over the sad ones. They wanted to hear Mary Poppins over and over they couldn't get enough of the idea of her having tea on the ceiling. When Christina would giggle, then Christopher would chime in, and then Cindy and Kathy would burst out laughing, even though they didn't know what they were laughing about. They only responded, of course, to the things they really felt. They took those things into their souls and still remember them today. I used to go out into the empty lots in Brentwood and play football with the kids. I taught my son and the three girls how to kick a football, how to pass and catch. And I think I had more fun than they did. I taught them swimming, riding, and tennis, ping pong, and badminton. On Halloween, we'd all dress up. And when they were very little, I'd carry both twins, one on each hip. We'd play trick-or-treat at all the neighbors' houses, and then coming back up our little hill where we lived, Christopher and Christina would carry the twins. Some of our neighbors, Robert Preston, Barbara Stanwyck, and Jennings Lang, and Monica Lewis, among them, probably remember these Halloween visits. Cole Porter lived very near, too. Another tradition was our Easter egg hunt with ice cream cones afterward. I don't know who had more fun, the children or the mothers and fathers. Kathy was not initially aware of her mother's stature as a Hollywood movie star. 
In their house, Joan Crawford was simply their mother, not a movie star. However, in 1950, when Kathy was around three years old, she had her first realization of her mother's career. Joan had invited friends over to watch one of her old films, Humoresque. Crawford had a separate theater in the back of their house, Kathy describes. During the screening, Kathy became frightened when she saw her mother's character walking to the ocean, believing she was going to drown. Overwhelmed, Kathy started crying and held tightly onto her mother's arm, gripping on her sleeve. Joan comforted her, explaining that it was just a movie and assuring her that nothing had happened. Nothing could be more gratifying to a mother than the moment when her children start sharing her world, when they begin to understand that she's a human being and that they can be friends. I discovered that I must have instilled a few of the social graces in the children when I let the twins take charge of their own ninth birthday party aboard the Andrea Doria. Captain Calamaya asked me if it would be all right if the girls planned the menu for the whole of the first-class passengers. Well, they did. I didn't suggest a bit of it to them. It was entirely their own menu. I had often told them, when you give someone something of your own, give the best. They learned that lesson only too well. On another Atlantic crossing that they made with their nurse, they were on the Ile de France when it rescued the passengers from the Andrea Doria. As soon as the twins woke up in the morning and heard that there were children on board without any clothes, they handed over all of their pretty lace-trimmed underthings, a beautiful gesture, but the recipients would probably have preferred warm wool coats. Both of my twins are a long way from Hollywood, but when they get together, they reminisce about their childhood with, they assure me, a great deal of nostalgia. They tell people they had a marvelous childhood. I hope they all did. I tried to give them that because it's really all that a parent can do. A parent has to guide, advise, educate, and love them. If they're sure of the love, they'll accept the guidance. Could you tell us something about your family? Uh, my twins are 16, and one is traveling with me at the moment. The other one is in New York uh, taking special art courses. Do, do any of them have any uh, aspirations for a show career? My eldest, Christina, yes. But the twins, no. The twins have never had any interest in the theater. Cindy, mother of two, is the wife of a successful farmer in Iowa. She was a born housewife, and she always adored cooking. She'd begged to be allowed to help with our favorite Sunday picnics, fried chicken and potato salad, or to help make the hors d'oeuvres. Kathy and her husband have two children also. He's a former naval officer, and they're both in love with boats. Kathy has considerable success with her painting. Still lives and absolutely exquisite miniatures. Carlton Varney commissioned her to do 75 floral paintings for the Westbury Hotel in New York City, and other commissions came in faster than she could cope with. Kathy would go on to attend Vernon Court Junior College, Pennsylvania, and the Fashion Institute of Technology for Education. Kathy also made a few television appearances in the 1960s, such as appearing in What's My Line? Well, get a nice surprise. Miss Joan just told me her daughters are here in backstage. Would you all like She's to meet them? She's a dog. Ah, no, 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 like Two of them. Come in. Cynthia? Cynthia, how are you? Mm -hmm. May I have the honor of presenting to this large uh, group, Cynthia and Kathy, and may we say that you have really brightened our show up tonight. <laughs> How nice to have you here. Christmas, part of Christmas holidays? Yes, it is. Got to go back to work soon. Tomorrow. Oh, no. Well, thank you so much Mr. for brightening Haley, our Christmas and New Year's. I just want to say God bless you. When you get a date, you always think of Bennett and myself. Kathy, <laughs> <laughs> same to you. Good night. Happy New Year to all of you. Right. Happy New Year. Twin Cynthia also went on to enroll at university, but at the University of Dubuque. She met her husband, John Jordan, there, 
and in 1967 they married, moving to Dubuque, Iowa, into a trailer home. She said she was always more, quote-unquote, country than city slicker. She earned $150 a week working in a shoe store and lived off her inheritance from the Crawford estate. A job offer lured Sydney to Jackson, Mississippi in 1984, but the work played out after six months, leaving her on welfare and without a place to live. The Salvation Army and friends helped Sydney survive during this time. They had two sons together, Jan, born in 1968, and Joel C. Jordan, born in 1971. In 1976, one year before Joan's death, the couple divorced. Life for Sydney was not easy as a single mother, but Joan supported the divorce. In 1995, Sydney said her life had gone from riches to rags to riches, then paused to explain. Riches isn't money, it's what your heart believes. It is the people around you. I love them all. On August 11, 1968, at age 21, Kathy Crawford, Sydney's twin, married Jerome John Lalonde at age 23 in Alexandria Bay, New York. Joan Crawford had announced their engagement a year earlier on December 1, 1967. Jerome was a petty officer in the Navy at Norfolk and had attended State College. The couple met while Kathy was working as a waitress during college as well. I always tell Kathy she was doing Mildred Pierce because of her waitress job, Joan said at the wedding. Kathy designed and sewed her own wedding dress, too. She was escorted at the wedding by Herbert L. Barnett, the chairman of Pepsi Cola at the time. The wedding reception took place at Pine Tree Point Club, where Pepsi, Fritos, Champagne, and hors d'oeuvres were served at the suggestion of her mother, Joan. They honeymooned on a houseboat in the St. Lawrence River and would later move to Norfolk. In 1979, Kathy appeared as a featured skater in the film Roller Boogie. Nearly 300 roller skaters auditioned to work on the film. However, only 50 were ultimately cast. After the birth of her children, she decided to become a stay-at-home mom. Later, from 1996 to 2006, Kathy worked as a bus aide for children with special needs. She loved every moment she was able to spend with those children, Carla Lalonde, her daughter, said. Though, the couple split in 1984, eventually divorcing that summer. They had two children together, Carla, born in October of 1970, and Casey, born on March 16, 1972. That same year, the family of four moved to Allentown, Pennsylvania, where Jerome had landed a new job. They would drive two hours to New York City from Allentown to visit Joan. Kathy also said in the 2008 interview with Vanity Fair, Quote unquote, they called Mummy Jojo. She liked that. They really loved the grandmother, and she really loved her grandchildren. They were in the next room playing, and Mommy asked me, Did they understand the difference in her being their natural grandmother or their adopted grandmother? I said, They only think of you as their grandmother. She smiled and looked very pleased. It takes two to feud, and I'm not one of them. I wish only the best for Tina. It is impossible not to wonder occasionally when rumor and gossip fan up brush fires about my relationship with my children, whether or not the special circumstances of our lives have any effect on our problems. But I know that there is difficulty in communication between parents and children, when the children are experiencing growing pains in the most typical home, with a full complement of both parents whose children were born to them, where the mother has never worked, and where there has been no prod of publicity to make things more difficult. It seems to come natural to many young people to rebel in all circumstances. Most teenagers find it difficult to listen to the voice of experience. It is only later, when they are grappling with the problems of adults, that they wish they could have listened. I used to think environment obliterated heredity. I was wrong. Christina, I have 
a letter here from your sister, which you know nothing about. This is written to me. I just want to read one passage of this letter. Uh, she wrote me this in September when she heard you were going to be on the show. This paragraph says, I've heard that you will be interviewing my sister, Christina Crawford, in October. Uh, it's later than that now, of course. I want you to know that my sister Cindy's and my feelings are in complete contrast to those of Christina's. We are ashamed and heartsick that she could come out with such malicious carp about our mother. Please know that there are many of us, especially Cindy and me, who respected, admired, and above all, loved our mother dearly. Sincerely yours, Kathy Crawford Lalonde. Since the death of the twins, Kathy and Sydney's adopted mother in 1977, they have openly defended Joan Crawford, denying all claims made by their older sister, Christina, in her book, Mommy Dearest. Quote, I was the luckiest girl to have mommy choose me, Kathy said. I wouldn't have chosen any other mother in the world because I had the best one anyone could ever have. She gave me backbone and courage and so much I could never say at all. But oh my gosh, the most important gift she gave me was all of the wonderful memories to last to take me through life. On May 28, 1981, Kathy Crawford appeared on Good Morning America to deny allegations made by Christine in a new book and the upcoming film. Quote, My mother was a very warm person. She was always there for us when we needed her. She was a working mother, but she always had time for us. And as far as Mommy Dearest, it is a great work of fiction. Christina must have been in another household. A month later, on June 15, 1981, Christina's lawyers threatened legal action by sending Kathy a letter if she continued to speak out in defense of her mother. That did not stop Kathy from defending her adoptive mother. Later in October of that same year, People Magazine published an article titled, Was She Devil or Dotting Mom? Dearesters a row among Joan Crawford's adopted kids. During the interview, Kathy stated, quote, Christina says Joan was rotten, and I say she was a good person. I just can't feel for anyone who would do that to their own mother. It's very immoral." End quote. Later, during a 1999 lawsuit against her sister Christina, Kathy contended the book Mommy Dearest was intended to, quote, defame the dead for crass commercial purposes, end quote. She went on to describe her mother as a, quote, good, kind, and loving mother. A year earlier, while Christina was promoting a new edition of her book Mommy Dearest, she claimed to interviewers that Sydney and Kathy were not actually real twins. The twins were upset upon hearing this, and Kathy filed a lawsuit at the U.S. District Court of Pennsylvania. Instead of going to trial in federal court, both agreed to use arbitrators. Kathy won the lawsuit against Christina for defamation and was awarded $5,000 plus court costs for public statements wrongfully made about the twins. She wasn't that kind of person that my sister Christina had said. She was very caring and loving. I've never seen um, mother lose her cool. She never lost her cool in front of us. I think sometimes she showed her frustration, but not in the cruelty that um, the book had mentioned. Um, she was a fine woman. She had two fine careers, one in um, an actress and one as a businesswoman and she never lost control. She was such a person, she was such a mother, that I never really thought about it. You, you and your sister Christine were raised in the same household, and it, to have completely different perceptions about this woman, that's gotta be very painful for you. Uh, yes, it is, um, but you know what? I don't, I don't dwell on it anymore. Um, I don't think about it. I think about my life with her and what she had done for me growing up. And she was just very generous, very loving, mm -hmm. and very nurturing. Finish the statement for me. My mother was, how would you, how would you describe her? My mother was what? Oh, God, oh. She was just wonderful. She was. She was very kind, though she was strict, you know, but she was, you know, 
all parents are in to a certain degree but that's how we teach our children and she was just a very loving caring person and i miss her every day while growing up Kathy Crawford said she and her twin sister Sydney always considered Joan Crawford their real mother and had no real interest in meeting or reconnecting with their biological family. Though, of course, naturally in 1999, they would reconnect with their biological family in Tennessee. In June of that year, Kathy saw a commercial of both Tennessee's children's home and with Glad's help, the twins began an 18-month-long search to find their biological father. They would uncover court documents, and it would eventually lead to a court order to open their adoption records. They learned their birth father was alive in Friendship, Tennessee, and were eager to meet him. A friend drove Sydney to meet him for the first time. On a small pond where her father approached her, she recalled, quote, He said to me, What do we do? I said, I don't know. What do you do? And he said, Why don't you give me some sugar? So I kissed him. Later, she would reconnect with the rest of her biological family, and so would the other twin. She would eventually move to be closer with her biological father and work for the family business. Though the twin's father would eventually die three years later of stomach cancer. Sydney Crawford passed away at age 60 on October 14, 2007. Kathy Crawford would die of lung cancer at her home on January 10, 2020. I believe the most important thing a parent can give children is the ability to stand on their own feet, achieve their own personality, slug it out with the world if necessary, and still not lose dignity, integrity, or a sense of humor. You don't try to keep them children. You keep giving responsibilities, preparing them for an adult world. My children owe me nothing but love and respect. They have given me, from the beginning, a tremendous emotional experience I wouldn't have missed for the world. Unlike Christina and Christopher, the twins don't resent my life. They link arms with me, and off we march into whatever life may offer. Sometimes great crowds of people, situations trying for children their age, into a sea of adult conversation, adult manners, sometimes regal formality. They have learned readily from everything, these two. We are so close, in such accord, we all reinforce each other. 